So in the field of visual psychophysics and neuroscience, sine wave gratings are probably the most popular stimulus and used extens extensively because sine wave gratings are building blocks to construct more complex stimuli. So you can think of it as kind of a you know Lego blocks of making visual stimuli. So let's take a look at some of them in more detail. So a grating is a repeating sequence of light and dark bars. So one adjacent pair of a light and dark bar um, makes up one cycle here, right? So that is a cycle. One light bar and one black bar um, next to each other uh, makes up one cycle. And these cycles uh, repeat over and over in a grating. <clears throat> within a given span of visual degree. Um, typically, we think of these gratings as uh, having sharp edges, like the you know, bar shown here. Uh, but um, you know, these gratings um, have become uh, known as uh, square wave gratings because their luminous profile looks like a square, as you can see uh, on the right. So when you cut through, the square wave along the x-axis and plot its luminous profile, you will see this abrupt changes in the luminous alternating between the maximum and the minimum. So, and then they have a same width. So even though uh, it looks like a simple one, uh, it's in fact a special uh, kind of grading that is made up by uh, made by uh, combining infinite number of different sine wave gratings mathematically, and because of the uh, the because the luminous profile only changes in x axis, this is a one dimensional stimulus. And the luminous profile of a grating can change in a number of different ways. So um, if the luminous profile of a grating follows a sine wave function, then it becomes a sine wave grating. So here is a typical sine wave grating where black and white bars are smoothly undulating along the x-axis without sharp edges like we've seen in the previous square wave. So you can see this undulation when you cut through uh, the sine wave grating and the, you know, the, if you plot the luminous profile along the x-axis, then you will you will be able to see uh, this uh, sine wave characteristic. And another special sine wave function um, that is very popular in psychophysics and neuroscience is called Gabor function. So this Gabor uh, is named after the Hungarian British Nobel Prize laureate Dennis Gabor. For inventing hologram, um, you've probably seen this. Um, I think it's Obi Wan Kenobi from Star Wars. Um, so this in in hologram. So um, the reason why this um, Gabor function was popularized in neuroscience was that uh, the response profile of a simple cell in B1, the visual cortex of mammalian brains can be nicely approximated by this function. So if you look at this, uh, this is Gabor here. Um, if you look at this, uh, you know, carefully, then it has a dark and light bar in the middle and its luminous intensity tapers off from the center to the sides in every direction smoothly. So that is because a Gabor is a sine wave function uh, modulated by two-dimensional Gaussian or bell curve, which you will learn uh, from the clinical research method. Well, you, you're going to talk. We're going to talk about the uh, normal distribution, the Gaussian function or the bell curve, in um, you know when we talk about the normal distribution in clinical research method. Anyhow, so this is the sine wave is modulated by two-dimensional uh, Gaussian function. And so that will give you this kind of a characteristic luminous profile of the Gabor function. So the pictures at the bottom uh, represent 
the three-dimensional rendition of the luminous profile of the corresponding pictures on top in two dimensions. So in this 3D rendition, the height represents the luminance. Um, one of the uh, well-known application of a Gabor function, as I said in um, the visual neuroscience, is the model response profile of the V1 neuron. So the receptive field tuning characteristics of V1 neurons have been modeled using even and odd symmetric Gabor functions um, as shown here. So hopefully you will um, learn more detail about the simple and complex cells in the V1 response profile in the other part of the, uh, uh, this module later. So one of the reasons why sine wave grading is so popular in neuroscience and psychophysics is that uh, sine wave grading is mathematically very well defined, so it is very easy to manipulate and change the aspect of the grading uh, that corresponds to a specific parameter of vision. So here um, we have the full equation to completely specify a sine wave grading. So the luminous profile of sine wave grading, L, right, is a function of the amplitude, so that is amplitude of sine wave function defines how high and low the peaks and valleys are um, in that you know, undulating function. And this, the difference between uh, the peaks and valleys um, defines the contrast of the gradient. And then here is just a you know, uh, the sine, sine uh, function, it can be replaced by, ten, uh, I mean, the cosine function, right? So you can have either sine wave grain, but then this is all, you know, same uh, family of functions. So you can replace this with a uh, cosine function. And also <clears throat> the appearance of sine wave grading is a function of the spatial frequency, F. That's spatial. frequency. Okay, so that defines how many cycles are contained within a defined span, such as a degree of visual angle, right? So if you have a um, high spatial frequency, then the width of each bar, light and dark bar, will be very, very narrow. Whereas if you have um, low spatial frequency, then you will see that the width of bars will be uh, quite wide. Okay, and theta um, here, right next to spatial frequency is the angle or the orientation. Orientation of a grading. But um, in practice, you need to have two-dimensional version of the sine wave equation to change the orientation of the gradient because this is just a one-dimensional equation. Uh, just changing the orientation here does not change the actual orientation of the sine wave gradient. And then this phi in Greek, that is phase that determines the phase of the grading. So that determine, phase determines the relative location of peaks and valleys. And finally, this L subscript M represents the average luminance. Uh, So that is kind of a middle brightness of the sine wave grading. And from this um, average luminance, it, the luminance profile of the sine wave grading will fluctuate. So if you change uh, any of these parameters, then you, you can change uh, the appearance of sine wave gradings. And this is really nice because, um, you know, 
if you want to study so, so for example if you want to study how sensitive we are to the orientation change right in uh, uh in an object then we can change uh the spatial parameter of sine wave grading to change the orientation or if we want to study the contrast sensitivity uh, then we can actually manipulate the luminous parameter of the grading which is amplitude right and so on so this is a really a, a kind of a nice property of sine wave grading that we can change the appearance uh, of the grading um, to study the corresponding aspect of vision. So um, I'm going to just show you how grading changes with um, changing parameters. So here we have uh, the original sine wave grading. Um, uh, having two cycles per degree, which is the spatial frequency of uh, this grading, actually. So that is actually F, right? That is the spatial frequency of this grading is, is two cycles per degree, okay? So the cycles per degree is the unit of spatial frequency. Now, if we change this grading um, in, in phase, right? So we're going to change the phase parameter. Then look at the location of the light and black bar. Okay, so light bar comes first and then black bar in this original grading. But if we change the phase of this grading by 90 degree, then see, you, you see this a change in the location of the peaks and valleys, right? And now we can change the contrast, the, the amplitude difference between the amplitude, um, which is the difference between the peaks and valleys. And this is, so we're going to just change this by half. Then you will see that the contrast of the grading uh, is reduced. And now we're going to change the spatial frequency. So we're going to increase the spatial frequency of the grading from here which was two cycles per degree, now it becomes eight cycles per degree. And finally, we can change the orientation of um, the grading, and then now it is actually tilted to uh, 45 degree clockwise. Um, and as I said, uh, just by changing the orientation of this equation won't change uh, the orientation, actual orientation of the grading, you need a two-dimensional equation, but just for the illustration purposes, um, all you have to know is that the orientation parameter will change the orientation of the grading. So um, here are some sample space of um, Gabor's varying in different parameters. So from top to bottom, you can see the gradings become more visible as the contrast increases. And this manipulation of visibility is um, achieved by manipulating the amplitude from the previous equation, uh, which uh, basically represents a contrast. And the contrast, we're going to talk about contrast later on um, in more detail, but contrast is a unitless. And in case of grading, uh, this contrast ranges from zero to one. So uh, it is usually expressed in percent. On the other hand, if you increase the spatial frequency of sine wave grading, then you can place more cycles in a unit visual angle, um, of which unit is cycles per degree. So the um, unit of the spatial frequency is cycles per degree. So the spatial frequency of the Gabor's on the left is relatively low compared to the Gabor's on the right. And finally, you can rotate sine wave grading to any orientations you want, but to do that, you need, you need a, a two-dimensional equation. Another basic stimulus frequently used in vision science is an optotype. So optotypes are basic letter stimuli for standard eye charts such as log mar chart. 
Though the letters are typically black, presented on white background, achieving high contrast, and their sizes are varying in discrete steps. The picture here shows um, the similarity between the Sloan or Tumbling E on the far left, square wave grading in the middle, and a sine wave grading. So as you probably know already, there are several optotypes in different style. So on the left, um, so this column is Snellen. So this is kind of a sample letters from the uh, Snellen chart. Um, so the characteristic of uh, the Snellen letters are that they are coming with the serif. So these extra stroke from the letter. So that's just the bells and whistles of a letter. So that is serif, which is just an extra stroke, right? So in general, um, you know, the fonts without serif is called sans serif uh, fonts. So sans, in Latin, this is a, a meaning without, without serif. Okay, so the, the middle one is a Sloan letter. Okay, so this is a perfectly square, five by five uh, size. Each side is a five unit. Uh, with a stroke width equal to one fifth of a side, so that stroke width, so that stroke width is exactly the one fifth of the entire letter size, right? And these Sloan letters are used in the logmar chart or ETDRS chart. And then finally, we have a British Standard and published. 1968. So the size of each letter is a five times um, uh, four, so a four across and five vertically. And other letters are um, tumbling E or Landl C, uh, as you can see, uh, but they are essentially uh, the Sloan letters. And not all the alphabets for all the uh, you know different acuity charts. Not all the alphabets are used because of the legibility difference among the letters. So far, we have talked about sine wave gratings and optotypes as two of the most popular psychophysical stimuli, but there are several other commonly used psychophysical stimuli, and we will have a more chance to talk about. Um, those stimuli as we go along. Here, I'd like to talk about one of the most rudimentary input stimulus parameters in psychophysics called contrast. So one of the reasons why I mentioned this parameter is because um, this parameter has been studied extensively to measure the limits of vision in the same domain. And also, contrast parameter is defined differently depending upon the type of stimulus you use in an experiment. So contrast is defined as a relative difference in luminance between the objects within a scene. The reason why con contrast uh, is considered um, important in psychophysics is that human visual system is known to be more sensitive to contrast rather than the absolute luminous, luminous of objects. So this actually shed light on how human visual system functions under a large range of fluctuation in light uh, uh, in real world settings. So first, uh, vapor contrast is used to define the contrast of isolated features of an image against a large uniform background such as a black optotype on a white background. So here, um, the delta, also the vapor contrast is the, uh, the ratio between the luminous uh, difference between the target and the background over uh, the background luminance. 
So here are some examples of the um, calculation of vapor contrast of optotype E with varying luminance against the different background luminance. As you can see, uh, vapor contrast can vary between negative 100%. So the negative will happen when uh, you have black optotype on the white background, as you can see from the far left. And it can go up to positive infinity when the letter is white on the black background. Here the CD represents, uh, so this is a unit of uh, luminous intensity, uh, red candela. So a candela per square meter is a, a typical um, unit of measurement for luminous intensity using photometer. Uh, in general, contrast of gratings uh, is defined such as, you know, square wave, sine wave, or Gabor is defined as the difference between the peak and valley over the average luminance of the grating. So for such images or patterns where the luminous profile is periodically fluctuating and repeating, Michelson contrast is generally used to define the contrast of those images. So this contrast can range from 0% to 100%. So as you can see from this equation, if you plug in the um, average luminance plus delta uh, and minus delta L or L max and L mean respectively into the Michelson contrast equation, then um, you're going to get the equation for vapor contrast back. Again, here are some um, example calculations of Michelson contrast for different square wave gratings on a same gray background of 50 candela per square meter. And finally, the root mean square contrast, or RMS contrast for short, is used for more complex images and patterns, such as natural images or random mass stereogram, stereograms. So here the, um, the numerator is basically the standard deviation of the pixel intensities or luminance in two-dimensional images scaled to the mean luminance, which is the denominator. So this um, contrast uh, ranges from 0 to 1, assuming that there's no outlier in the image. So here is an example of uh, RMS contrast calculation for a complex image on the left. So when given the mean and the standard deviation of an image, then the RMS contrast is a normalized standard deviation of luminance. So the graph on the right shows the corresponding luminance changes of the picture on the left to the points located under the red and blue lines.